in uh, discussing the Enlightenment as we began to talk last time, uh, the ideas of the Western Enlightenment uh, came uh, to the Jews as well. And uh, a reform in Germany uh, can be seen as a product of the Enlightenment. Uh, now, reform in Germany, uh, beginning in the early 1800s, uh, turned radical. It uh, felt that in order to be German, you had to give up practically everything. So I mentioned to you that uh, Saturday became Sunday. Uh, the uh, Reform uh, Temple uh, assembled the <laughs> Lutheran Church. The clergy uh, dressed as the uh, Protestant ministers did. Uh, there was an organ in the uh, temple. It, uh, and the Hebrew language uh, was dismissed. It was only in German, and any reference to Zion in Jerusalem was taken out of the prayers. Uh, it was a complete uh, break with all tradition. It was not a gradual thing, but it was a uh, ra really radical is the only word. And it swept all of Germany. Uh, the overwhelming majority of German Jews became reformed. And the uh, situation was such that the Jews in Germany felt uh, that uh, there were great opportunities open for them, and that in order to take advantage of the opportunities, they had to discard their Jewishness. Many even discarded being Jews with a large number, there were a large number of conversions uh, to Christianity. In fact, the entire 19th century is uh, marked by uh, conversions. It's estimated that as many as 250,000 Jews in Germany and Central Europe, Bohemia, uh, Slovakia, uh, converted, Austria, converted to uh, Christianity because of the fact that that was the opportunity to get into the Western world. Now, the three most famous converts uh, in the 19th century uh, were uh, Heinrich Heine, the great German poet and uh, literary figure. So Heine lived most of his life outside of Germany. He lived in Paris. But uh, he was a very tortured person. He had the self-hate that Jewish converts usually have. Uh, but he was torn by the fact that he was uh, Jewish and that somehow he couldn't escape the fate of being Jewish. The uh, other famous convert uh, was uh, Karl Marx, whose father, Marx, was a German family. His grandfather was an Orthodox rabbi. Uh, Marx's father had already converted, and Karl Marx was baptized when he was, uh, when he was young, but uh, Marx uh, rebelled against all religion, but he re rebelled against Judaism particularly. He had a great hatred for Judaism and Jews. He wrote an anti-Semitic book called The World Without Jews. Uh, and he is the one who uh, coined the phrase, uh, mimicking Luther, uh, that uh, Mammon, money, is the god of the Jews. Now, Marx, in his uh, attacks on capitalism, uh, so he made the Jew a capitalist. The irony, as we all know, will be that when the communists came, they made the Jews a communist, so that the Jews on one hand were the capitalist exploiters, on the other hand they were the communist revolutionaries. So whichever side you wanted to vote on, it was the fault of the Jews. And uh, in the 20th century, 
this illogical uh, paradox uh, took a tremendous toll on the Jewish people. Hitler ran uh, on the basis of uh, Jews being communists, but he equated Bolshevism with Judaism. And Stalin uh, equated Jews with being capitalists. And uh, hence, uh, he justified his anti-Semitism. So uh, was not, this was not pleasant, to put it mildly, for the Jews. But Marx, uh, in the Communist Manifesto that he wrote with Frederick Engels in 1848, and all the revolutions that came then, and the ideas of socialism and communism, Marx had a profound influence on the Jewish people and within the Jewish people. Because what Marx did is he took Jewish ideas, uh, fairness to the working man, well, that's in the Torah. Uh, paying decent wages and on time, that's in the Torah. Uh, Non-exploiting of others, don't, don't exploit anyone, that's in the Torah. Hello, sonu isha sreyu, you're not allowed to exploit, you're not allowed to take advantage of other people. Uh, and he also took the great messianic dream of the Jewish people that we're going to have a, a utopian world. The great world is going to come. And he married all of these ideas to his crackpot theories of economics. And then what happened was uh, that Marxism turned into a uh, fearsome uh, machine uh, that uh, in the 20th century destroyed literally hundreds of millions of people. Between Chairman Mao and Stalin and the other uh, little Marxists uh, that were running around, uh, so human life lost its value completely. Because when you try to reach the perfect world, everything is expendable. Everybody is expendable and everybody stands in your way is really the enemy of humanity because they're standing in the way of the perfect world. And this uh, idea of utopianism, of uh, messianism, of a perfect world, uh, really is what uh, destroys uh, much in human life. You hear it today, on the left especially, uh, who still long for a perfect world. Well, we all long for a perfect world, but it's not the, that's not the way to go about getting it. And longing for a perfect world uh, has to be discounted a little by the nature of human beings. And if you don't do anything to change and improve the nature of human beings, uh, then the perfect world will never arrive, no matter how coercive the government is in forcing you into the perfect world. If you want to understand, uh, you know, Marxism let loose without any inhibitions and without any uh, sense to it, you read the history of China from uh, the Communist Revolution from 1948 till uh, the middle of the 1970s at least, for 30 years. It's estimated that uh, 60 to 70 million people were killed uh, the country was impoverished, all kinds of crackpot ideas. Everybody was going to have a steel mill in his own backyard. Everybody's making steel. Meanwhile, the steel mills have no workers. Uh, agriculture, you take everybody out of the cities and send them to work in agriculture. So there's, then no food is produced. So you have great famines. All of these ideas, right? But, uh, uh, the, the basis of Marxism is that the book is right. It's got to happen the way he said it was going to happen. Now, Chairman Mao had a little red book. I mean, I'm, what I'm telling you sounds like ancient history. We're talking 25 years ago, 30 years ago. And people will walk around with the little red book and read from it. The way a uh, pious Jew reads to heal him every day. And Chairman Mao was supposed to have swam, uh, I know, 100 miles upriver on the Yangtze River when he was 90 years old. All of this craziness. And you got a whole, you got a billion people that are under this craziness. 
but that was Marxism let loose. There still are Marxists in the world, but uh, not many. Uh, the 20th century has proven the bankruptcy of his ideas. And uh, in Jewish life, uh, the Marxists were very strong. In fact, much of this country, much of the country of Israel, uh, was founded and operated on Marxist ideals and a Marxist system. So it's broken down over the last 50 years, but it's still got a way to go. And the, and the uh, encumbrance of government on every uh, facet of life here is a direct uh, heritage of Marxist thought. So you had Heine in literature, you've got Marx in economics, Marx wrote an enormous book called Das Kapital, which I don't think anybody's ever read. It's, uh, well, it's an exaggeration. There always are doctoral theses. But uh, his book in German, you know, about his ideas about capitalism and uh, capitalism uh, has to come into being and it has to become powerful, etc. And then finally, it will explode by itself, and then will come socialism, and after socialism, communism. So uh, none of that happened. But because it was written in the book, and, the, uh, and Jews are true believers, you know, no matter what. The rabbis say uh, if you talk to them about the Baal, about idolatry, they're for it. They'll contribute. If you talk to them about the holy Mishkan, they're for it. They'll contribute, you know, whatever, whatever... Uh, Whatever idea, right? So it's really in the presentation of the idea uh, that, that the key is. A part of Marx's uh, theory was that religion has to be abolished. All religion. He called religion the opiate of the masses. By that he meant you know, if a person is, God forbid, ill, he's sick, but you give him opium, you give him drugs, so he doesn't feel for at least initially, right? He doesn't feel any pain, doesn't feel he's sick, he's on a high, doesn't realize uh, that his body is wasting away. So Marx said the same thing about religion. The people that are poor, the lower class, the downtrodden people, the people who are workers, etc., as long as they have religion, they don't realize that they're supposed to rise up and throw out the bosses. And because religion preaches, all religions preach, the ability to accept adversity, the ability to stay uh, within one's limits, so to speak, uh, the ability to be... Uh, happy and productive even in a situation that is not ideal. So that was the opium of the masses, right? People, uh, people had had faith that they went to, to church every day. Uh, so they're never going to make the revolution because uh, they're, they're hoping that God is going to help them. So therefore, in order for the... Uh, uh, revolution to occur in order for the destruction of capital to occur and for a socialist communist world to come into being uh, you have to destroy religion and therefore atheism became the faith of Marxism and uh, it was uh, it was uh, enforced rigorously by all communist countries uh, part of the irony of our time is that undoubtedly religion has defeated communism. Poland, Russia, all the places where uh, it was uh, curtailed, it was uh, forbidden, etc., uh, religion has made an extremely strong comeback. And uh, the, the ideas of communism, socialism, of Marxism have disappeared. Jews are stubborn, though, so in, the, in, in much of the uh, 
Jewish uh, camp, uh, religion has not yet reappeared. Even though uh, the Marxist ideas are, all, are fading there as well. And uh, this idea of atheism, uh, it's, it's a completely different confrontation that Jew than traditional Judaism ever faced. So reform, uh, which was, uh, what should I say, uh, you know, it's like Diet Coke. It was, uh, you know, it still was Coke, but it's not the same. But uh, uh, the uh, ideas of, of Marx, of atheism, that's something else that's a different brand completely. That's something that Jews couldn't measure. And for the traditional Jewish world, they really did not have a, a very good response to it because uh, of many reasons. But one reason that has to be said is that the Jewish establishment in Eastern Europe, the people who had the money, the thin crust, the half of 1% of the Jews that owned factories and etc., were uh, exploitative capitalists, were guilty of all of the crimes that Marx said they were guilty of of uh, workers having to work 16 hours a day. There were Jewish factories in Poland that were owned by religious Jews that would not hire Jews because they were open on the Shabbos, the factory. So they obtained a uh, Shtar Shabbat, a Sabbath uh, uh, document that uh, allowed them, quote unquote, to uh, be open they took a fictitious non-Jewish partner, but they wouldn't hire any Jews. So here you had uh, thousands of Jews that were unemployed in the Pale of Settlement, that were starving to death, and then they couldn't get a job with the Jewish, with the, in the Jewish factories. And the reason they couldn't get a job, because of religion. A religion that skewed isn't, uh, you know, that misses the whole point. But that's what happened. And therefore, there is no surprise that, for instance, the largest uh, Jewish organization and political party in Eastern Europe uh, in the 20th century was uh, the, uh, the labor, the Bund. It's called the Bund. It was a labor union. It's... Uh, the Histadrut in a more aggressive form, if you can imagine such a thing. I just walked by all of our wonderful garbage outside. You know, why should they put out the fire? It's, uh, they're waiting for the firemen to go on strike too. Eventually, uh, the. Uh, There was an enormous resentment against this upper class. And the lower classes of the Jewish people became radicalized. This labor union, the Bund, was uh, anti-religious, to put it mildly. As late as 1939, uh, with the war already beginning, in Vilna, uh, the Bund had its annual banquet on Kol Nidre night, on the night of Yom Kippur. Ah. I'm going to show you. And I remember in the United States, they always used to have uh, uh, their American branch, the Workman Circle, used to have the Yom Kippur night dance. And posters all over the town. So you see, we've come a long way because in Israel, no one would do that. You know, not in no, no matter who, that they wouldn't do. You know, there's that lesson we've learned. But the Bund was enormously powerful. It was the largest Jewish political party. It always had the most votes and the most representatives in the uh, parliament, uh, both the Lithuanian and the uh, Polish parliament, uh, the Jewish representatives, uh, the Bund was enormously powerful. The Bund was uh, anti-Zionist, 
because Zionism didn't fit in with Marxism. Marx is looking for the universal revolution and there should be no nationalism and there is no holy country there and everything is all the same. And, uh, and uh, what happened was that uh, uh, Stalin took care of the Bund, killed them all out because uh, they had the uh, double uh, misfortune of A, being Jewish, and B, of not being exactly uh, Leninist, Stalinist, you know, and the, it's a strange thing in ideology. Uh, if I have, uh, let's say, ideology 100%, and there's somebody that has 0%, so I don't bother with him because he's a lost cause anyway. But if I have somebody, mine is 100 and his is 90, I go after that guy with the 90. I'll destroy him. You'll see that in Israel, you'll see it in, in the religious world, in our world. You know, just a little different, right? That's it, get him. And so the Bund was a little different than the communists, and therefore he destroyed them all. And they all ended up in Siberia in the slave labor camps. They're in Lubyanka prison with a bullet in the back of their neck. But that was a direct product of Marxism. And it took a long time. We are still in the midst of expunging that from our midst. So uh, Heine was one apostate and Marx was the other. But there's a third apostate man by the name of Benjamin Disraeli in the 19th century. Disraeli is one of the most uh, fascinating figures in all of history. Disraeli was born a Jew. He didn't become an Anglican until he was 14 years old. And the reason he became an Anglican is because his father had a fight with the Gabbai of the Shul, which is perfectly understandable why one should therefore become an Anglican. But that's exactly what happened. His father was a member of the uh, famous London synagogue, the Bevis Mark synagogue, the oldest synagogue in London from the 1700s, Sephardic synagogue. And uh, there are different accounts as to what happened. Either they wanted to raise his dues or they wanted him to serve on a committee or they wanted, they wanted his father to do something and he had a big fight with the Parnassim with the board of directors, etc., and they had a real fight, and he said, I'll show you, and he took his two children and converted them to Anglic. So he probably would have done it anyway, because, uh, but this was like the trigger. And uh, from the time he was 14, uh, Disraeli was raised as an Anglican. Now, Disraeli uh, was a character. He wore the most outlandish clothing that you can imagine outlandish colors, yellow, green, he was the, uh, uh, I mean, he, he, you knew him when he was coming, I mean, you could see him coming, right? And he uh, was an author. He wrote dime novels. He made a fortune. Sold millions of copies of his dime novels. And all of his life, even though he's an Anglican, he's a Jew. Not only a Jew, uh, so you have Heine who uh, tried to escape being Jewish, Marx who denied and hated Jews, the Israeli on the other hand made himself great as being a Jew because he invented a pedigree for himself. And he said that the, the, the Israeli family comes from the the rulers of Judah thousands of years ago were a family of aristocrats. Now in England, in the 19th century, being an aristocrat was an important thing. Uh, nobility, even though it's called the House of Commons, but the uh, nobility still uh, played a great role. And so he created this uh, pedigree of nobility for himself. And he's the one who said uh, 
when uh, you were, so in Parliament, well, see, he became a Tory, uh, and he uh, was a very good orator, excellent orator, and very skilled in debate. Now, in the House of Commons, uh, debate is an art that's practiced. People interrupt in the middle. So in, in our wonderful Parliament, it's just insults back and forth, right? It's just, uh, you cannot, uh, you know, there's almost no witticisms involved. But uh, in the British House of Parliament, the debate is brought to uh, its highest level. Uh, and there always are uh, clever jabs and plays on words and all sorts of things, you know, you be, to be a skilled debater. And he was a very skilled debater. So what happened was that when he would get up to speak, the uh, liberals on the other side, the liberal party, because then there was no Labor Party yet, uh, they would holler, uh, old clothes for sale! Because the Jews were peddlers on the lower, in the, uh, in the east end of London. And that was the caricature of a Jew, is that he, was a sh he sold shmatas. So you get up to speak and they're hollering old clothes for sale. So he coined the famous line, he said, my ancestors were kings in Jerusalem when yours were grubbing for mushrooms in the marshes of England. So he used his Jewishness as a weapon, even though he's an Anglican. And there are not many people who could walk that tightrope. But he did so successfully his entire life. He was a confidant of Queen Victoria. He was uh, her favorite legislator at a time when the queen still meant something. Uh, huh? Prime Minister. Well, then he became the prime minister, right. Then he led the, uh, he led the uh, conservative party to victory a number of times. And he was the prime minister of England. And he's really the man who invented the imperial system, the empire of England under him. India became part of England. He, he made her empress of India. Uh, he was a, uh, an out-and-out -out, uh, British imperialist when imperialism was not a pejorative word, when it was a positive thing and not a negative thing. And uh, he... Uh, he fought for what was called the Jew Bill. Uh, the Jew Bill was passed at, uh, in England. Until the Jew Bill, Jews legally didn't have rights in England. Jews had been expelled from England in the 13th century. They came back in the 18th century, but they came back unofficially. Nobody uh, bothered to throw them out, but they were not legal. And the Jew Bill... Uh, uh, took care of all of those impediments. And there was a very large scale immigration of Eastern European Jews to England. Many of the Eastern European Jews who came to England thought they were coming to America. They got off the boat. You know, they, they, they embarked for New York and the boat they landed in Southampton and they got off. Uh, when I was in Ireland and I spoke in the uh, shul in Dublin, so they had their uh, memoir from one of the original founders of the shul in Dublin that, you know, like 30 of them got off and they said, you know, where's the Lower East Side, right? We want to go to, and they didn't realize they got off in Ireland and they didn't have enough money to get back on another boat. So they stayed in Ireland and they built a community in Dublin, <laughs> which, uh, you know, except for driving on the wrong side of the street, there's not much, you know, why not? So when you had uh, this uh, uh, person, the Israeli, in a very uh, strange sense, brought pride to the Jewish people. He's like the only convert that we're proud of. You know, we're not proud of Marx. We're not proud of Heine. We're not proud of all the other... Uh, we call them apostates, right? They're deserters. But the Israeli uh, enhanced the Jewish image. 
uh, he was made a lord. He was called Lord Beaconsfield. Now, if you look in the, uh, there's a British uh, magazine called Punch, which was a, which was a, st a satiric political magazine uh, with cartoons. So in the 1800s, the cartoons regarding the Israeli today would be considered anti-Semitic, but then it was acceptable, you know, big nose and the whole thing. But uh, the Israeli was a force. He was an enormous force. And he was a, uh, a, a person that, uh, that captivated people. Well, now, naturally, he married a non-Jewish woman. His descendants are all non-Jewish. They have nothing to do with the Jewish people. But uh, it's a, uh, it's, it really was one of the phenomena of the times. So he had these three uh, 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 converts away from Judaism, each one representing a different path. Now, there were a lot of people that wanted to be Disraeli. Because after all, Disraeli made good. One of the interesting things about Disraeli is that one of his novels, and a few of the novels that appears, there always appears someone who is going to arise and uh, bring the Jewish people back to the land of Israel. That's a theme that exists in his novel. And, uh, uh, for instance, when Herzl, uh, Herzl came to England to testify, uh, it, the, the Jewish immigration to England was so large that in 1903 and 1902, uh, the British House of Parliament made a select committee uh, to discuss limiting Jewish immigration into the country. And Herzl came to speak in front of the committee. Herzl came to speak in front of the committee because he said, you're right, there are too many Jews in the country, but if you'll give us Palestine, uh, we'll take all the Jews there and it'll relieve your problem, right? That, that was his contribution to the problem. But when he spoke to this select group in Parliament, one of them said, uh, Dr. Herzl, you are the living incarnation of the Israelis uh, Tancred of the hero of his story that's going to arise and take his people back and bring them back to their homeland. And uh, there was, for a long time, in the, in the 1800s and the 1900s as well, a strong uh, undercurrent of a very pro-Zionist feeling in England Churchill was part of it, but uh, and, uh, having nothing to do with politics or anything, it just was like part of the English psyche that it was going to be a good thing and that the Jews should go back. And uh, a great deal of that was due to Disraeli and to Disraeli's novels. It's, uh, he really is a fascinating figure. There are a number of good biographies of him. But there are, there are paintings of him that, uh, that are really, I mean, there's a painting, you know, the costumes that he wore, literally, literally costumes. And he was, the, he was the biggest dandy in the House of Commons. And he was, and because that uh, coupled with his outstanding uh, oratorical abilities and debating skills made him a very, very formidable person. So there were, it would be understandable that Jews would want to be Disraeli, but the opportunity didn't arise uh, because of the fact that, that there's never been a uh, Jewish prime minister since, though there have been Jewish members of the cabinet. You have now Jack Straw, who was the foreign minister of England, who comes from a Jewish family, but they are, he's, he is a converted Christian. So. Uh, you have those types of things. And you've had uh, Jews, uh, full-blooded Jews, that have also had high office in England uh, uh, for ministers, etc. But uh, we never had another person that equaled the Israeli. And it's, uh, what, what is really uh, telling about it is that both the non-Jews and the Jews considered the Israeli Jewish. 
even though, as I mentioned, he was uh, he was a complete he was a complete Anglican. He always spoke about his Judaism as being uh, uh, the preface towards being a Christian. In other words, that you couldn't discard Judaism and Judaism is right, etc. But it's you have to go one step further, and the one step further was the Anglican Church. Whereas other apostates uh, turned against their Jewish roots and turned against their Judaism, uh, Israeli never did that. All right, so you have here this uh, period of uh, the 1800s, this period of the Enlightenment that sweeps all over European Jewry. And uh, for uh, hundreds of thousands of Jews, it means conversion. For other hundreds of thousands of Jews, it means reform. Uh, the complete uh, uh, abdication from any uh, performance of uh, Jewish mitzvot, uh, of Shabbat, of dietary laws, of anything, all of that is gone, and the absence of any Jewish nationalism. But then you have uh, what's called the Haskalah, the Enlightenment, which came to Eastern Europe, which was different in character completely. In Eastern Europe, reform wasn't going to go. It would not be popular. Uh, there are many reasons, but I think I, I think I explained it to you once that the, the main reason was that no one really wanted to be like his Polish or Russian or Lithuanian peasant neighbor. It held no uh, attraction. Well, if you lived in Germany and your neighbor was a professor in the University of Berlin, uh, you know, and Germany was a highly cultured country and everybody went to the concerts and there was Gemütlichkeit and, you know, and they had uh, uh, beer and they had good desserts and stuff, you know. So Germany had a, you know, so why not be a German? But no one wanted to be the Polish peasant who lived next door to you in the same town who was abusive and violent and alcoholic and illiterate. So uh, the, the drive for change did not take on the same uh, uh, type of uh, action that it did in Germany. In Germany, reform was to make the Jew like the Christian to make him look and behave just like his non-Jewish neighbor. And it was to take Judaism and make it look like uh, a modified form of Christianity without having to acknowledge the Christian Savior. But that was not the case in Eastern Europe. There was no chance for that to happen. But what did happen in Eastern Europe was that the ideas of the Enlightenment came into play and those ideas were seen as the solution to the Jewish problem. Now, beginning in the 1800s, we have this phrase, the Jewish problem. Now, the Jewish problem originated in Russia under the czars. But then, uh, because of the propaganda of the czars, it spread throughout Europe so that even today you hear people talk about the Jewish problem. And it's interesting that the Jews themselves adopted that type of language and spoke about the Jewish problem. I remember when I was growing up in Chicago, there were always a series of lectures about uh, you know, the elephant and the Jewish problem, the uh, you know, uh, Chicago Cubs and the Jewish problem. You know, that, that, that whatever topic always ended up and the Jewish problem, right? Because the Jewish problem, we, we also felt that it was real somehow the Jewish problem. The Jewish problem was never the Jewish problem, it was always the non-Jewish problem. But when you're a minus, so today it's not the Jewish problem, it's the Israel problem. Right? There wouldn't, if Israel wouldn't be here, it would be a wonderful world, right? So in the 1800s and the 1900s, they said if the Jews wouldn't be here, it would be a wonderful world. Of which, uh, it's pretty frightening to think that uh, very little has been learned uh, over the last 200 years and over the graves of hundreds of millions of people because the Jewish problem uh, wasn't limited to Jews. 
uh, destroyed Europe. Now the Tsars uh, didn't know what to do with the Jews. They just didn't know what to do with them. They couldn't, they didn't, couldn't incorporate them into uh, their system because it was a, a dictatorship and because everybody in Russia was supposed to belong to the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, and the, uh, the policy of the Russians always was to oppress minorities. Which, in the, when the commun when the, when the Soviet Union reached its height, but it still exists today. And that's why when people had a chance to break away from the Soviet Union, most of the so Union of Soviet Socialist Republics opted out. Now, uh, so the Tsar and his ministers came up with a uh, slogan that the solution to the Jewish problem lay uh, one-third assimilation. By that they meant one-third of the Jewish people they would attempt to convert to uh, Russian Orthodoxy, to, Christian, uh, to the Christian faith. One-third extermination, either through starvation or pogrom. One-third emigration, and a third of them they'd forced to leave the country. Uh, when, after the American Civil War, there was, uh, began large immigration of Europeans to the United States because the West was open. Uh, so you had two and a half million Jews that picked up from Russia and left. But the Jewish birth rate was so high uh, that the two and a half million were made up so that the total Jewish population in Russia never diminished. Uh, one of the uh, really uh, strange things is that in 1800 there were about two and a half million Jews in the world maybe three million. And in 1939, there were 19 million. And in 2002, there are about 14 million. So all the numbers are not natural. I mean, the Holocaust did it, but uh, even without the Holocaust, there should be way more than 14 million. So uh, one-third assimilation. Well, he, they never accomplished the one-third assimilation because Jews uh, were not easy converts. Very, very few converted. Those that converted were from the top uh, intellectual class who wanted to get ahead. They wanted, you couldn't be a professor in a university in Russia unless you were a Russian Orthodox. It was, uh, so if you wanted to get ahead, there was a famous Jewish uh, apostate in Russia that uh, that had very that remained very close with the Jewish community. So the the story is told. It probably is a legend, but it it certainly points out the issue. The story was told that uh, uh, they once asked him, uh, a Jew once asked him, "How come you converted?" I mean, do you believe in that uh, in icons and all the and all the, the nonsense of the, uh, almost the paganism of the church in Russia. He said, no, I don't believe. I said, then why did you convert? He says, I thought about it, and I see that it was worth it. So he said, what do you mean it was worth it? He said, I thought about it, and I said that it's better to be a professor in St. Petersburg than a Malamed in Pinsk. And that pretty much described uh, what happened here, is that if you wanted to get ahead somehow, we have a you know, painful story, but I, I just want to tell it to you as an example. Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, the great founder of the Musser movement that we're going to talk about uh, eventually. Uh, so his name is Lipkin, Rabbi Yisrael Lipkin, the uh, former uh, Israeli chief of staff, Lipkin Shachak is a descendant of his. Uh, so if you saw Lipkin uh, had a son, he so he's the great rabbi, the head of the Muslim movement, he had a son 
uh, who was uh, went away from tradition and who was a brilliant mathematician, brilliant mathematician. In fact, even today in uh, mathematics, uh, his theory is still studied. It's called the Lipkin parallelogram. It's a whole theory, uh, combination in trigonometry, etc. He was a genius in it. And he was such a genius, and the Russians wanted to have him in their university that they made him a university professor in St. Petersburg, even though he did not convert. But otherwise, uh, the one-third assimilation had to happen. Now, the one-third extermination, they tried also. But you have to realize that uh, no, one, uh, no one imagined uh, Hitler's methods. No one understood what could be done if you really set your mind to doing it. And therefore, even though there were pogroms, and the pogroms were government-sponsored and government-allowed and police-encouraged, uh, but you're talking about small numbers. Uh, the great Kishinev pogrom, uh, over which Teddy Roosevelt uh, in the United States uh, threatened to break diplomatic relations with Russia, uh, killed 41 Jews. Now, 41 Jews is one pigua today. That's no numbers. And we're talking about over 6 million, right? So what's 41? But uh, no, one, uh, no one had the, uh, you know, the breadth of vision that Hitler had, that the Nazis had, the Germans had, of what could be done if you really set your mind to it. So the one-third extermination also didn't happen. Because if you kill 41, that's not going to solve your problem. And the one-third emigration, as I mentioned to you, was made up. It was made up by the soaring birth rate. A birth rate probably uh, uh, that the Jews didn't have since the time that they were in Egypt. When they started out with 70 and then ended up with millions and millions. And so Russia is stymied. You're stuck with the Jewish problem. And there were, a few, therefore, a number of answers uh, that came into play. What is interesting is that the Jews themselves tried to provide an answer. The Jews felt, or a section of the Jews felt, and especially the section of the Jews that was close to the Haskalah, uh, they, they felt that uh, if the Jews were modern, the Jews had a culture. The Jews didn't dress funny and look funny and smell funny, uh, that uh, the Russians would accept them. They could become part of Russian society. And don't forget, Russian society had uh, great parts to it as well. Russian music, the great composers. Uh, Russia is a, very, is a soulful place. Had great literature. Uh, had inspiring figures. So uh, all of this together, uh, uh, the Jews felt, well, we will provide Russia with, its, with, you know, with the solution to their problem. And the solution to that problem is that we're going to become uh, modern, civilized. We're not going to become reform. You see, reform changed Judaism. The Haskola attempted to change Jews. Reform was a new form of Judaism. Uh, the Haskalah was not a new form of Judaism. They said, you know, you'll be a Jew in your house, and you'll be a regular Russian on the street. On the street, nobody will recognize you as a Jew. You won't have a beard. You won't wear funny clothes. You won't, you know, nobody, you know, you'll speak Russian. In your house, you can do whatever you want. You know, in your house, you can, your house can, only have, you can have every stringency that you want, every humrah, whatever you want to do. Now, that was the basic tenet of the Haskalah, not realizing, because again, it takes 100 years for you to test out a theory that if you're a Russian on the street, eventually you become a Russian in the house, too. 
which is really what happened. Uh, and that's what happened in the United States also. Uh, we're all Americans, right? But if you're really American, so then, uh, then you eat a McDonald's, you know, and uh, Saturday you go to the football game, and you don't have time for all this. And that is the experience here uh, of uh, what happened. So next time we'll talk about uh, what the Enlightenment program was and what the different sections in the Enlightenment were and how the Enlightenment has survived until today in various forms here in Israel, whereas in the United States it almost is non-existent. <laughs>